All right, Matthew chapter 16. Let's look right down there at the chapter starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, if you remember, this isn't the first time that this has happened. We just went over this about four weeks ago in Matthew chapter 12. Uh, it's almost the same exact type of scenario where he says, uh, he, you know, obviously there's a little bit different details there are than in Matthew chapter 12. But in both cases, they're just saying, hey, show us a sign. You know, show us a sign that you are the son of God. Show us some kind of sign. Even though he's like healing all these people, he's preaching the gospel, he's reaching the poor, he's, you know, he's doing all these things, but they're like, show us a sign. And he responds to them here again. Now, and look at verse number two. It says, He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? He's saying, you know, you're really good at looking at the weather and looking at the sky and be able to determine what, what the climate's going to be like the next day or in the morning or that day. He's like, you've been able to observe all the other things around you to be able to tell what's coming up. He's like, can't you, you can't see the signs of the times? And I think the reason why he's rebuking them like this is because there's been so much prophecy already regarding the coming of Jesus Christ all throughout the Old Testament. All in, in, in the Old Testament, the scripture, from Moses, the prophets, you know, everybody prophesied of the coming of Jesus Christ. All the prophets prophesied of the coming of Jesus Christ. So he's like, you, you can't even see like any of these signs that are coming to pass, like any of the stuff that's already been prophesied and already been written. And he's rebuking him for it. And then he says in verse four, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So he basically gives them the same answer. We saw this already in Matthew chapter 12, where he says, uh, and he went into further detail about Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And I don't think we t actually turned to, did we turn to Jonah 2 on that week? Does anyone remember? Because I don't remember actually going there. It wasn't in my notes. I thought I just kind of skipped over and said, just read that later because there's a lot of things that I had to go into. We were already had to, that was actually Matthew 13 when I was going back to tw chapter 12 because we didn't get to everything. So I actually want to take the time right now to just turn to Jonah chapter 2 to just make sure we don't leave any of these stones uncovered when we're going back. Because if you remember Jonah, there's four chapters in Jonah. You got chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Chapter 1 is the story of, of God telling Jonah, hey, you need to go and preach in Nineveh. And he said, you know, basically he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. So he goes the other direction. He gets on a ship. And then there's this great storm, right? And they're praying to all their gods and stuff. And Jonah's like, yeah, it's because of me, right? And, you know, I'm giving you the real brief summary of this. So they cast him overboard. God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And at the end of chapter 1, Jonah's overboard. The whale comes and he swallows him up. Chapter 2 is what we're going to look at. This is when he's in the whale's belly. Chapter 3, or chapter 2, ends with him being vomited out, right? And then chapter 3, he goes and preaches in Nineveh. And then chapter 4, he kind of, he's standing out, or sitting outside the city, just kind of waiting and watching and see what's going to happen with, you know, after he just preached there. So that's the whole book of Jonah. Now what Jesus said is that there's not going to be a sign, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And there's basically two things that you can look to that you would even equate anything with, with what's current events that are happening in the book of Matthew, okay? Him sitting outside the city and just watching, that's not, there's no sign of the prophet in so doing that. Um, the beginning where he's running away from God, he, he's not, again, he's not showing any signs. There's nothing prophetic in him running away from God. So the only places we're going to find is chapter 2, which we'll see in just a minute how much prophecy there really is in this, just, just talking about future times. And then the only other thing you could tie back with this, which is also referenced in Scripture and uh, in other accounts of the Gospels, is just Jonah going and preaching to repent. Right? Destruction's coming, repent. Basically, the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? That's what Jesus was going and preaching. And Jonah's going into the city and warning and preaching to the people, repent. There's destruction coming, you need to repent. 
And that's what John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching to repent. The people need to repent, right? Um, and the people listened to Jonah. And we'll see that, well, we see that in other accounts where it, he said, you know, they, they listen to Jonah. But we hold a greater than Jonah is here, right? So, but in, in this sense, when he's talking about looking at the signs, looking at the signs of the times and everything else, uh, he's not referring to Joseph, Jonah's message because his message really isn't uh, a sign, right? That's not, that's not a sign of the prophet. Just because Jonah preached the same message that Jesus is preaching, essentially just, hey, repent, that's still not a sign. The sign comes in chapter number two. Look at verse number one of Jonah chapter two. The Bible reads, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, so his is his prayer to, to God while he's in the whale's belly. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So he's saying here, he's like, I'm crying out of the, not just out of the whale's belly. Now he's saying out of the belly of hell. And it's important to realize this and understand with prophets, with the prophets of the Old Testament, especially as they're, as they're writing scripture, or as picture, scripture is being written down, as it's being spoken, as it's being written down, as it's being recorded by the author, the human instrument author is, is oftentimes foreshadowing or speaking in a sense of another person, right? So you think about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, when Philip goes and approaches him, he says, you know, understandest thou what thou readest? He says, how should I accept some man should guide me? And he says, well, well when, he's, when he was at the portion of Scripture, it says that he came as a sheep, uh, dumb before a shearer, right? And, and he, said, he said, well, who, who is a prophet speaking of here, of himself or of some other person? Because that's the way that prophecies work. It's, it's sometimes they're speaking of like their own current events, but then sometimes they're speaking about Christ or about some other figure in the future that's not them, but they're speaking in first person as if it were them. And what we're going to see in Jonah chapter 2 is this back and forth between Jonah being in the whale's belly and Jonah prophesying the sign of Jesus Christ who's going to die and go to hell, of Jesus Christ's soul in hell. Those are the two things that are being uh, compared back and forth where Jonah's speaking kind of on his own experience and speaking prophetically as if he were Jesus Christ. That's why it says in verse 2, I cried... By reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So verse number three, for thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. This is talking about Jonah, right? He's, he's in the deep. He's in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Physically, he's in the sea. Verse four, then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. And this, you could, see, you could see either Jonah saying this or also Jesus Christ. You know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's cast out in his sight. This is another prophetic example of Jesus Christ being, being rejected of God the Father when he was on the cross. Verse number five, the waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped ab about my head. So again, he's in the water. He's in the whale's belly. He's got seaweed around his head. But then look at verse number six. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Now, the, the whale didn't go inside of the earth so that the earth's bars was about him forever. That just, that physically just didn't happen. That, that can't happen. This is talking about Jesus Christ's soul being in the heart of the earth because the bars of the earth were, were around him forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. And that corruption is the death. Um, and it brought up his life from corruption. The Bible says his body, Jesus' body didn't see corruption even though his body died, but his soul went to hell. And hell is a place of death. So his soul did see corruption in the sense that he was literally being tortured and tormented and burning in hell. And again, and this isn't Jonah. Jonah Jonah's life wasn't in that corruption. 
but Jesus' soul was. Verse number seven, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy, holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And, you know, just referring now to salvation, being saved, that the, the Savior, um, the saving event that Jesus Christ did for us. And we're going to see here, even in context of Matthew chapter 16, in the same chapter, just a little bit later on, and I'm going to get to this kind of naturally in order, but what he does is he basically starts to tell the disciples about the gospel, that he's going to need to go to Jerusalem, the chief priests are going to, you know, they're, they're going to start to attack him, he's going to get arrested, he's going to get uh, beaten, he's going to get crucified, and, and he's going to rise again from the dead. He starts to, uh, we see that a little bit later in this chapter, that from this time forward, he starts to explain that to his disciples, because up to this point, he, he never revealed that truth unto them. He never really told them all the things that are going to play out until in this chapter he starts to open up that truth to his disciples. But it's fitting that he brings up the sign of the prophet Jonas in the same chapter that he starts talking about everything that's going to happen to him, which one of those things is his death and his burial and his soul's dissension into hell. Let's keep reading here in verse number five. I don't want to spend all like too much time on that. I, I've preached multiple times on this, but I just want to make sure that it's very clear in where we stand on this doctrine because this doctrine has been under attack and a lot of people in Baptist churches are balking at Jesus' soul being in hell. And if they say, well, it was in hell, but, it, but it, I mean, it wasn't torture and tor torment hell. It was just this other side of hell, this other compartment within the heart of the earth that doesn't have any torture and torment or anything like that but it was just this not so bad of a place, which you can't find any reference to hell in scripture, not even one that has anything even close to resembling a place that's not so bad. Never, not one time. It's just, it's a made up doctrine out of the imagination of someone's wicked heart to try to say that Jesus didn't go and pay for our sins in hell because they want to just believe, oh, when he said it is finished, that just means everything was finished completely that Jesus had to do. No, it wasn't. Because I think the resurrection is pretty important, too. I think the three days and three nights of being dead is important, too. I think it's all important. It's all part of the gospel. It's not just the death. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Let's keep reading here in Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Now, there's a little, there's, this is, even just in these few verses, something important that we need to remember and be diligent when it comes to the Word of God. I'm sure we've all been guilty of doing something just like the disciples did here. They hear, so already it's on their mind that, oh, we've forgotten the bread, right? So they, they have this failing or something just for whatever reason, it's on their mind. Oh man, we forgot to bring the bread. You know, I hope Jesus isn't going to be mad at us. And then at the, at the first drop of the word leaven, because leaven's associated with bread, right? You leaven bread to get it to rise. So they're just thinking like, oh man, Jesus is upset with us now because we didn't bring the bread. But they're not actually listening to what he's really saying. He doesn't say anything about bread. He's using leaven as a word to describe the doctrine of the Pharisees and how it infects and how it, it's going to just create more and more bad doctrine is the teaching he's trying to give them. But because their mind is focused on this bread that they forgot to bring, they're just reading into what he said where they shouldn't be reading into. And we need to be careful when it comes to the word of God that we don't read other things that aren't even there in the scripture 
Just because something might be on your mind or you think a certain thing about this or about that, and then you just start reading that into the scripture, let the scripture speak to you. Don't do the speaking for the scripture. Don't put words in Jesus' mouth. Because that's essentially, now, this didn't happen to be like some big deal, like as far as, you know, they're not preaching some false doctrine. They just, they're just thinking like, oh man, we're being rebuked for not bringing bread. But it's because they weren't listening very clear, uh, carefully to what Jesus was saying. And we need to be careful because while sometimes it may not have like great ramifications, sometimes it will. And when you start just, just reading into things way more than what you can see on the surface, be careful with that. I'm not saying that God's word isn't extremely deep and that there aren't a lot of meanings when you dig into God's word. Of course there are. I mean, you could go really deep into looking at stuff, but be careful when you do that, that you're not just reading so deep that you've completely just, just gone beyond what the words actually say and when, what it's just clearly saying. Jesus clearly said, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Not one reference to bread at all. It was just a symbolic reference through the word leaven. But even this still, be careful with doing your word studies and everything too and starting to tie together things that really don't fit. Just because you see particular words being used here or here, you go, oh man, well that just, that just must mean that it's talking about the same thing. No, it doesn't have to at all. Look at the context, see what this is talking about, see what that's talking about. People, I've heard this argument about Christmas and Christmas trees. So here's just an example. Um, maybe even, I consider this kind of a silly example, but where the Bible and Jeremiah talks about people who are decorating an idol and, and building an idol, right? And they overlay it with gold. And, you know, this is how they would, they would carve up. They'd cut down a tree. They'd carve up the wood. They'd overlay it with gold and silver. And then they'd set it up and they'd bow down and they'd worship the idol. I mean, that's how idolatry works. That's, this is what the Bible describes. But because it uses words like you deck it with, you know, silver and gold. And we say, well, what, deck. I mean, it's using that word deck. What, deck the halls, right? I mean, that's, that's what we use at Christmas time. You're decking the Christmas tree. So this must be talking about Christmas trees because, hey, it says you're chopping down a tree. Right? Huh? Chopping down a tree and you're decking the tree? No. It's talking about an idol. It's not talking about the practice of putting, you know, decorating your house with a tree and, and putting ornaments on it. That's not, I mean, it's just not what it's talking about. That's reading way too far into what the passage is actually saying. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who bows down and worships the Christmas tree Oh, Christmas tree. Oh, Christmas tree. You know, help me out because I'm in need here and you're my God. No, that's not, that's not the purpose of it at all. Now, if someone's doing that, okay, that's idolatry. And now you shouldn't do that. <laughs> that's not right. If you're bowing down and worshiping a tree, thinking it's a God, yeah, that's wicked and wrong. And then you wouldn't be reading too much into that passage if someone was actually doing that. But that's not what happens. And I'm going to get into, when it gets closer to Christmas, I'm going to, I'll probably end up preaching more about the, you know, people hate on Christmas and Easter and all these other holidays and stuff. And I don't think there's anything wrong. Well, I want to say anything. There are some things that you could do that are wrong, but I don't want to get too far off on that rabbit trail. The point is, when we look at this, it's easy sometimes to, to let your mind kind of go off in another direction. And we need to be able to be diligent and careful when we read scripture so that we're not misapplying and just reading something into it that's just not there. Because that's exactly what happened here. So now when Jesus hears, he says he perceives rather what they're saying. Because they're talking amongst themselves going, oh man, it's, you know, I mean, we didn't bring the bread. That's why he's talking about this. Like, like we're being rebuked for this. Verse 8 says, when Jesus which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? 
Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? He's saying, come on, guys. You think I care about you forgetting bread? He's like, don't you remember when we were in need and we only had a few loaves of bread and a few fishes? What happened? Everybody was fed. It wasn't a problem. We took up leftovers. This happened twice. You remember the 5,000? You remember the 4,000? You remember all this stuff? You really think that I care that much about the physical bread? Like, get your mind off the physical. I'm not talking to you about some bread that you left behind. I'm talking to you about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's saying that's what's important. That's what you need to remember and realize. He's like, don't get so worried and hung up on this other physical stuff. It's not about the bread. Look, I'll take care of you. He's already proved it. You don't have to be so careful and worried. Oh, man, we forgot the bread. Look, is it important to work? And should you be you know, prepared? And should you kind of do a good job? Yeah, of course. But don't let that just be everything. Jesus rebuked Martha. Remember, Martha came to Jesus when she's like, you know, hey, I'm doing all this work by myself. Where's me? Can you tell Mary to come and help me out? And Jesus answered, he said, you know, Martha, Martha, thou art uh, very troubled over many things, right? And, he's, and she's, she's doing all this, this other work. He's like, but she's, she's doing that which is needful. I mean, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus and receiving the doctrine. There's a time for work. Everyone needs to work, but there's more important things oftentimes that you need to just be able to stop and, and listen and hear. And Jesus is just trying to get this through to his disciples. He's like, you know, obviously, and he doesn't even rebuke him for forgetting the bread. It's, it's, there's not even a rebuke. Would it have been good for them to have remembered it? Yeah, but he's not, that, he's not worried about it, is the point. He's just not worried that, that they forgot to bring bread. It's not even a, a concern for him. He's like, just receive the bread that I'm giving you. I'm teaching you good stuff. I'm teaching you about the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's what I'm talking about. It says in verse 12, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And we get the extra interpretation here that the leaven he was referring to of the Pharisees and Sadducees is their doctrine. That's what he was talking about when he said the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's their doctrine. It's their teaching. Is that... And, and the whole point is that the Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, they're these false prophets and they're teaching false doctrine. And what happens with this false doctrine is that it starts to corrupt and infect other doctrines. Because what leaven does, you add a little bit of leaven to the bread, but the, the leaven gets mixed in and intermingled with all of the bread. Right? It creeps into everything. And that is the way that bad doctrine works. Because if you think about it, when you study the Word of God, when you come up with doctrines, in order to be true doctrines from God's Word, they can't be contradictory to other doctrines. You can't have one thing in one place saying one thing and then another thing saying something that contradicts, is contrary to the other, right? Otherwise, it's bad doctrine. So in order to try to make everything fit together, you have to come up with these different doctrines to try to make it all merge. And when you have bad doctrine, in order to try to make that doctrine fit into the big picture of God's word, you have to start, oh, we got to move this over this way. We got to move this over that way. And you start tampering with and corrupting other doctrines until it just spreads and, the, and all of your doctrines is bad. Uh, a real easy way to understand this, I think most of you here are probably pretty well versed when it comes to end time stuff. We preached about it a bunch here. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff you've probably followed. Um, but when it comes to something that in and of itself isn't the most important doctrine, right? The, the timing of the, tri of the rapture and, and the, the timeline of events for tribulation. But it's a good example of, of how it's not just one doctrine that's impacted. It's multiple things. 
So the people who believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, so the rapture that takes place before any tribulation, before anything else happens, they have to be able to deal with scriptures like Matthew 24 that very, very clearly say after the tribulation of those days, the sun and moon shall be darkened, and, and, and it talks about the angels gathering together the elect, right? So they say, aha, see, elect. Elect is not believers. So that's how they try to make their, their doctrine of, well, the pre-tribulation is true, pre-tribulation rapture is true, and, and what Matthew 24 is talking about, see, that's talking about different people. That's talking about Jews. Jews are elect, not believers. And then it gets into this Zionism doctrine that the Jews are God's chosen people, and that's why they're elect. And, and you go off on this whole other area. And then in addition to that, you need like some form of dispensationalism too. Because as you start looking at these various passages that all talk about the timing of the rapture and things like that, you have to be able to explain it away somehow. So it leads you down these other paths that start in infecting other doctrines because you have to try to make it all fit. And, and this is what Jesus is warning to beware of, and it's like leaven. Bad doctrine is just like leaven. And that's why we need to be careful, especially not just with doctrines like the rapture, because while in and of itself it isn't the most, like I said, it's not the most important doctrine. It's an important doctrine. It's not the most important one. It's not something we're going to you know, break fellowship over. But even with the doctrines that aren't as important, you still need to be careful because it's going to start impacting other doctrines in other areas and in other, th other ways that you view the Bible and you view God and, and the doctrines that you, you, you hold to because you're trying to make everything fit together when you've got some leaven in there. And the leaven starts to impact other things. Uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. That was just one pretty easy, I think a pretty easy way to understand, at least for most of the people in our church, how, how that all ties together. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, there's actually a warning of doctrines of devils that's going to be taught in the latter times. Right? And, and this, this speaks to us perfectly. We're in the latter times. So we need to take heed to this warning, and it's going to bring up um, these doctrines of the devil. Look at verse number 1 in 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible reads, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in the latter times there's going to be doctrines of devils. But he goes on to explain what some of these doctrines of devils are. Look at verse number 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So these are bad people. These are false prophet reprobates because their conscience is seared. They don't, they, don't, they don't feel right or wrong. It doesn't matter. They can do wrong and they have no conscience about it. That's what it says when their conscience is seared. I mean, when we do wrong, hopefully, you, you, your, your heart is pricked, Right? You, you, you don't feel right. Something's not right. It's, it, it, it's like, man, that's, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I feel so bad. I don't know why I did that. God, I'm sorry. You know, you, you have these types of, you have a conscience about it. But the wicked people out there, they're able to do wickedly and it doesn't even bother them. There's no natural affection. See, naturally, you know, you have sympathy for people and empathy for people that are going through hard times and, and you see things happening. That's a natural affection that God's given us. But these reprobates, they don't have that natural affection. They don't have a conscience. That's why they're just able to do whatever. Because it's not going to bother them. They can kill somebody and it's not going to bug them. It's like, no big deal. That's why they're able to destroy children's lives by defiling them because... They just, no conscience, no conscience. That, that one phrase alone, having their conscience here with the hot iron, I mean, whew, you go on and on on that subject, but that just helps you get a, a full understanding of what these people are like and watch out for them. But anyways, let's, let's get into the doctrines of devils because these are the people who are going to start promoting these doctrines of devils. 
Because they're devils. They're, do they're doctrines of devils because these devils are bringing forth these doctrines. And look at what some of our, look at verse number three, forbidding to marry. Oh, no, no, you can't marry. Oh, if you're going to be a priest, you got to be celibate. You can't marry. It's a doctrine of devils. You say, well, who forbids to marry? The Catholic Church? Doctrines of devils created by reprobates. I mean, you, you can't even just make this stuff up. This is, it, the Bible is just so amazing. This has just all been written. And people just take this stuff as commonplace. Like, of course, yeah, I mean, priests can't get married. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it has been. I mean, it's against the Catholic Church. Do you ever read your Bible? I mean, it's calling forbidding to, what does forbid mean? You can't do it. You're forbidding to be, to be married. It's a doctrine of devils. Especially when the Bible says that the bishop must be the husband of one wife. The bishop! And that's a term that the Catholic Church even uses. There's bishops and cardinals, right? Are the bishops allowed to be married in the Catholic Church? Because it's a doctrine of devils. That's just the first one. And how about this? Commanding to abstain from meats. Now, I love me some clam chowder. But do you know there's a reason why restaurants serve it on Fridays? It's because of the Catholic Church where they forbid to eat meats on Fridays. As you go through Lent, right? And, and you, you, on Fridays, good Catholics, they're not supposed to eat meat. Isn't it amazing, these doctrines of devils, for being to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, both have to do with the same religion, a religion where you've got a huge number of the people that are in charge and running, these priests, are pedophiles. They have no conscience. They can defile children and it doesn't bother them. And commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanks thanksgiving. Which, by the way, great passage showing that there's no dietary restrictions in the New Testament on anything. There is no more abstaining from meats. It's all been good. Hey, are you receiving it with thanksgiving? And go ahead and eat it. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he's saying, beware of these doctrines of devils. Beware of these people that, that have their conscience seared. And if you can retain all of this and, and teach all of this stuff, that's good doctrine. People need to be warned about this, taught that, hey, you don't have to abstain from meats. It's all good. And don't be forbidding people to marry. It's not good that the man should be alone. Doctrines of devils. So be careful of that because, again, it's, it's this leaven that just infects these doctrines. And be careful who you get your doctrine from. Notice he's warning them to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So you think they ought to just be going down to the synagogue and listening to these Pharisees and Sadducees give them all kinds of bad doctrine? No. Watch out for that. Don't get your teaching and your learning from these, these devils that are just going to be corrupting your doctrine because what they were doing is that they were, they were usurping the authority of God and making the commandments of God of none effect by their traditions. Oh yeah, there's another one, the traditions. The traditions of the Catholic Church that can supersede and overrule the Word of God. Nothing new under the sun. Watch out. I mean, how does this not just come alive to people when you read the Scripture? It's like if you're, if you're painting a picture, you're reading the Bible and it's painting a picture 
Oh, I wonder, I wonder who fits the bill on all of these things. Of course it's the Catholic Church. It's one of the biggest organized religions out there in the world. A lot of people are deceived thereby. And it's wicked as hell. Let's keep reading Matthew chapter 16. Let's go back to Matthew 16. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So Jesus now is saying, you know, what are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And he gets John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, okay, or as one of the prophets. This is going to help us understand who Jesus is. And I've touched on this before. We'll look at it again. This, this picture that we get of Jesus Christ, the picture that was being painted in the minds of other people is one of these prophets. If you want to know a little bit about how Jesus was, how he acted, how he taught, the way that he said things, the way that he looked, we can look at who people thought he was because we have more information from all these other guys too. I mean, if people are, are going, man, this is, like, this is like Jeremiah's back from the dead. This is like Elijah. This is like John the Baptist. I mean, when Herod heard about Jesus doing all the miracles, he was like, that's John the Baptist. And when we read or hear about these people in the Scripture, let's let the Scripture speak for itself. I'm not, you don't have to turn there. You could, if you want to, you could turn to 2 Kings chapter 1. We're going to look at an at illustration or an example of Elijah there. But in Matthew 3, we covered this already. Matthew 3, 4, about John the Baptist, it says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now, we know from Scripture that Jesus wasn't out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey because he was eating and drinking, right? He said that John the Baptist, he was out, he wasn't eating and drinking, but Jesus was, and they call him a glutton and a wine bibber, right? So, uh, as far as the food goes, but... Jesus was still, the way that John was preaching, what he was teaching, repent. He, was, he wasn't dressed in, in these robes. We know that Jesus wasn't dressed in a long robe because he was condemning the Pharisees who loved to be wearing the long robes and greeted in the marketplaces. He wasn't wearing that stuff. John definitely wasn't. He's got a leather belt. And he's out, he's just out in the wilderness. He's got camel's hair, right? And that's what he's wearing. And he's, he's out preaching boldly, publicly, rebuking, teaching. I mean, he rebuked Herod to his face. He was doing it publicly so that everybody knew this guy's wicked. And then... When people are looking at Jesus and at what he's doing, how he's preaching, they're saying, this is like John the Baptist. That's how Jesus was like. Let's look at uh, Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse number 6. The Bible says, And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us. So this is just other people explaining who they met, because they met Elijah. Okay, so they gave a description of Elijah. There came a man up to meet us and said unto us, Go, Turn again unto the king that sent you and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. Huh. Another leather belt, right? And they're saying, this guy was a hairy guy. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. But notice, even more important than just the way he looks, I, I would bet that Jesus was wearing a leather belt, for one. But that's not even that important. Look at the way that in, with John, as well as with Elijah, they're sending these rebukes to these kings. What did Jesus do? Go tell that fox. How about that? 
the way that, that, that these men of God all would boldly just stand on the word of God and they were unwavering. They would just come right out and say the truth and they don't care who it offended and it doesn't matter what the, con the physical consequences are, they're going to make sure what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And, and they're just going to go ahead and say it. And these are men that Jesus was being referred to. Jeremiah, did Jeremiah back down? No. He was cast into the dungeon. I mean, he was eating bread and he was in his mire. And, and I mean, he had to suffer because of what he preached. I mean, they're putting them in the stocks. They're doing all this stuff based on what he preached. So when Jesus comes around and he's preaching boldly, he's speaking like no man ever spake, you know what they're thinking of? Wow, this is like Jeremiah. This is like Elijah. This is like John the Baptist. That's who Jesus was. He was not this soft, sissy, spoken, you know, pacifist. That's not who it was. That is not the picture you need to have in your mind when you think of Jesus Christ. He's like all these other prophets. And you start going through and, and pay attention to this. When you do your regular Bible study and you're going through and you're reading your Bible cover to cover, and especially you're going through the Old Testament and you're looking at these men of God, just start thinking about the characteristics of these men because these are good characteristics to have. And look at their boldness and look what they, I mean, Samuel hewed those rulers in pieces. Samuel did it. The priest. He was a judge, but he was a, but he was a priest. And he, he was just, he had no problems going and saying, all right, we'll do it. And they're like, they're like, surely, you know, you're, <laughs> we're, this is all kind of blowing over, right? I mean, you're not as angry as you were before. Like, like you guys won, right? He, and he, he, he chops them up, chops them in pieces. And you can look at what these men of God did through the power of the Holy Ghost and what type of men they were. And Jesus fit the mold with all these other men of God to the point where they're just saying, man, this is, he's just like one of them. So just to help you understand the picture of who Jesus was, that's, that's some good information there. Is what, what everyone around it, this isn't who Jesus is presenting himself to be. This isn't even who his disciples are presenting him to be. This is just, what is everyone talking about me? And this is what they're coming up with, and this is what they're saying. That's the public perception of Jesus Christ. Remember, Elijah preached against Baal and Ahab and Jezebel, right? He was mocking the, the priests of Baal when they're going to, to, to cut themselves and they're all sincere. To, oh, wait, but Jesus would respect all religions. Really? That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You mean to tell me Jesus respects all religion? I don't think so. Then why is he telling you to flee idolatry? That's another religion. He has no respect for that. It makes him angry. And you think, I need to respect all religions? My Savior doesn't respect all religions. I'm not going to respect all religions. There is no respect for these devil-worshipping, satanic religions. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16. Verse 15. So Jesus asked them, you know, well, who are people saying I am? And then they answer him. And then he asks his disciples, but who do you say I am? So he says unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So he's not saying you're John the Baptist or any other, he's like, you're the Christ. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And again, you know, I, I've been, this has just been coming up just so much in the scripture. I've been hitting a lot on the Catholic Church lately. And it's just over and over again. And I already covered this like last week, I think, and the week before. But how do you not? And the reason why, when it comes to this, is if, you, if you've ever spoken to someone who's Catholic, they're going to tell you that, well, the Apostle Peter was the first Pope. The first Pope. The first Papa. The first Father. And this is nonsense. He's not the first Pope because Jesus Christ founded his church on himself, on Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of the church, not Peter, not anyone else. Now, he does give the church authority, but, and we're going to get into that more next week, but it's not, it's not this uh, tradition of men. He's not giving authority to tradition of men that's going to make the, the word of God of none effect. Because that is what the Catholic Church does. They put, they put even more emphasis on the tradition of men within their, within their religion. And if it contradicts what the Bible says, well, we've been given that authority. No, you haven't. They call Jesus the first pope and they're not reading. Have ye not read? Matthew 23, you don't, you don't have to turn if you want to. Matthew 23, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ saying, But be, ye, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. All three of these titles that he's, that he's saying not to be called, these are all titles given to religious people. So when he says, be not called father upon the earth, he's not talking about your physical dad. He's not saying you can't call your own paternal, you know, ancestor, your own father, father. You can't, you, he's, no. He's talking about rabbis, masters, and, and fathers in, because all three of these have to do in a religious setting. Teachers, instructors. You don't call some teacher master. You don't call some teacher rabbi. And you don't call them father. It's so clear. I mean, it, you, can't, you cannot twist this scripture. The only way you can twist it is to try to make it just to have zero meaning at all. Because, and I forget, I looked it up quite a while ago, what the Catholic Church says about this passage. But basically, they make the word of God of none effect. Because there really is no application then where a person can't call someone else a father. I mean, there isn't. They'll, they'll try to have some weaseling way of, of dealing with the scripture to say why it's okay that they're calling their priests fathers. But they never explain, well, who can we not call father then? Because then there's nobody. Because who is it going to be? Well, someone who's not really your father. Well, you call the, the Catholic priest father. I mean, it's, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 20. Because I made reference to this earlier. I forgot, I forgot I had the reference in my notes. But I'm glad I did because I like to prove these things. I don't like just even just quoting the scripture or, or, or referencing it or summarizing it. I like you to be able to see where these things are in the scripture themselves. Because in Luke chapter 20, we see the rebuke of the spiritual leaders of the time of Jesus Christ, the pompous scribes and the Pharisees. Look at verse number 45 in Luke chapter 20. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes. So he's saying, beware of these people that like to walk in long robes. So in the time of Jesus, were there people walking around in long robes? Sure. But do you think Jesus was one of those people who he's warning about? Don't, they like to walk around in their long robes. Don't be like them. Watch out for these guys. You know how you're going to spot these guys? They're walking around in long robes. 
That means not everybody's doing this. If, it was, if everybody's walking around in long robes, why would you say, well, they love, you know, well, no one else loves walking around in their long robes, but these guys love it. <laughs> like, how would you even know the difference if everyone's walking around in long robes? You wouldn't. How do you really know who loves it and who doesn't? Someone's got a big smile on their face. Watch out for the guys who are like, I love my long robe. And, but the other guys who are just walking around in long robes, don't worry about them. No. Because not everyone's wearing long robes in the time of Jesus. They're not wearing dresses, okay? These hyper-spiritual people, these false prophets, they are, and they still do today. And Jesus is warning about them, and it's no different than today. Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. These are the people that like to walk around with their collar backwards, right? Just so people know Hey, I'm, I'm a holy man. I'm going to wear this outfit just so everybody around me knows who, I, knows who I am. Because they love, oh, oh, Father. Oh, Father, would you, would you please pray for me? Oh, you're so great. Oh, we're going to have a dinner. Here, I'm going to put you in this place here. You're going to get the best seat. You're going to, you know, like... They love that stuff. And that's why they go around wearing their garments to make sure people know who they are because they want to get these, these, this recognition from man and they eat that stuff up and it just fills their, their pride. And then they say these long prayers which, man, I've been in the Catholic Church Mass before and there are some long prayers but that's like hard to stay awake for some of those and make these long prayers. But then there's always people like, oh, that prayer was so beautiful. That was, it's for a show. It's not because it's actually coming out of their heart. It's because they want to look good in front of people. It's why they wear the clothing. It's why, well, clothing. That's why they make the long prayers. It says, but they devour widows' houses. You got these old widows coming and, and giving them this money and stuff, and the, and the guy's just a phony and a fraud. And he doesn't care that, because he has no conscience, that these women are giving up all they have or whatever. And the Bible says, though, that these are going to receive greater damnation. <coughs> yeah, there is parts of hell that's worse than others. Because there's no way you could receive a greater damnation if there was no such thing. There has to be. So let's go to Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 16. But these are the people that he's talking about and he's warning about. Verse number 19 says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This does not mean that the church or any man can overrule God's word. That's not what he's saying here to them. Oh, well, you know, whatever you buy. Because with the Catholic Church says, well, whatever we bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. So basically, we just make up the rules as we go. We can just, we just say and do whatever we want as if this is just an open check to, to do whatever you want. It's not. That's ridiculous. There's already been enough preaching about people making the word of God of none effect by their traditions. So he's not just saying all of a sudden, well, now, Peter, you can just make up all the rules that you want and it's just fine. No. But at the same time, there is authority given. There is. And there are things that are bound in heaven that are bound here on earth under that authority. But I don't, I'm not going to get into all that tonight because that, we're going to get more in depth than that in chapter 18. Chapter 18 talks a little bit more about this and we're going to get some more information on that. So I'm going to kind of hold off on really expounding into all the ins and outs of that for a couple weeks. Uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So he just got done asking them, you know, who do men say that I am, but who do you say I am, right? And he says, well, you're the Christ. And he's like, well, that's great. God's opened that up to you. God's revealed that to you. 
It's not just flesh and blood, but you, you know, God's allowed you to, to understand that truth. But then he says, okay, now, but don't tell people that I'm the Christ. Now, this wasn't like he never wants them to know. It was just for the time being. Jesus has a specific mission that he's, that he's going on. He's saying, okay, we'll just wait. Right? He start, he's, he's revealing himself more fully to his disciples because everything needs to play out. There were times in Jesus' ministry where people wanted to take him to become the king because they're saying he's the Christ. Jesus doesn't want that happening. He doesn't want them to just basically force him to become a king and have this big, you know, potentially revolution or uprising or whatever where they're going to say, no, Jesus is our ruler. He's the Christ. He's the king and he's going to rule. So he didn't want that just being said because it, that wasn't the right timing. He needed to go to the cross. He needed to die. But his disciples need to know it because they're going to go out and evangelize the world. They're going to go out and preach the truth and preach the gospel to every creature. But at first, he needs to reveal it unto them. And he's saying, okay, now you know, but just wait. Don't go around spreading this yet. It was still all part of his plan. So when you read that, don't think that it's not, it's not necessarily weird that he's saying, well, don't, you know, don't tell anyone. I thought we're supposed to tell people that Jesus is the Christ. Yes, we are. But again, in the context here it is specific to the timing of everything that needed to be done. So it was, it was just temporary. Verse 21, from that time forth. So prior to this, Jesus hadn't revealed how he was going to die and stuff. But from this time going forward, now he start, he's okay. You understand I'm the Christ. I am the Christ. He, he, didn't, he didn't tell Peter, no, I'm not the Christ. He says, hey, God revealed that unto you. Good job. God's opened up your eyes. He is the Christ. He's not denying it. And now he's starting to just show them and give them more information so that they'll be prepared, so that they'll just kind of understand things because he has to go through all these things. So, so from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. This is the gospel. He's, explain, he's starting to expound and explain the gospel unto them. But look what happens next. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now why is, Jesus, why is Peter saying this? He's saying this because he loves Jesus. And he still doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the point. He's not understanding everything that needs to happen. So, but, but he's taken upon himself, though, to rebuke Jesus, which he definitely shouldn't have been doing. That was wrong of him to do. You can see where his heart was, but his, you know, just following his heart led him led him astray here in rebuking Jesus Christ when Jesus is telling him, no, this is what needs to happen. And he's like, no. And that's why Jesus rebukes him really sharply in the next verse. Look at what it says, verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter. He's talking to Peter. He's not talking to Satan that's like standing at his right hand. He's talking unto Peter. But he uses, he refers to Peter as being Satan because he needs to emphasize just how wicked what he just said was in regards, you know, in this, in this back and forth. Because Jesus just said, I need to go to Jerusalem. I need to be arrested. I need to be, you know, this stuff needs to happen. I need to die and, and, and be put to death and be raised again from the dead. He's like, this stuff needs to happen. And when Peter said no, be it far, no, that's the last thing that needs to happen. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou art, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. He said, that, that's fleshly wisdom. That's the man wants that doesn't want this to happen. He's saying, but the things of God, this has to happen. And Satan is an adversary, and he's like, you, no, nothing can stand in the way between Jesus and what he needs to do. He has to go and do this. This is the will of God. This is what needs to happen. And, and no man should, is going to stand between Jesus and, and what he needs to do. And, and Peter needed that, that rebuking. And this is another example of just, 
God thinks of everything, right? Because God knows everything. So when you have a Catholic church saying, oh, well, see, he's been given all this authority and Peter and he's the Pope and all this stuff. Jesus just called him Satan in like two verses later. And you think he just has all authority? No. Peter didn't even get it. We're not putting that much trust or authority into man. That's cultish. The only man that has that much authority is the man Jesus Christ because he's not just a man, he's, he's God and man. He's the son of God and the son of man. That's why we're Christians. We follow Christ. We don't follow Peter or any other man. Any opposition to the gospel is of the devil. And that's this, Jesus faced an opposition when he just explained the gospel. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I don't think that Peter was possessed by Satan. I don't think that... Now, regardless of whether or not Satan was whispering in his ear and, you know, trying to get... I don't see that from the passage because Jesus didn't talk to Satan at his right hand. He says he, he, he responded to Peter. And, and like I said, I, I think the reason why he did this, it's not that confusing. It's just because he's saying something that's satanic. He's op opposing the gospel. And Jesus is just being real strong with his rebuke and just making sure that there is no misunderstanding about what he's, you know, how serious this is. Like, no, this has to happen. There's, there is no misunderstanding this whatsoever. You don't mess with the gospel at all. Look at verse number 24 here, Matthew 16. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And he's trying to, to explain the spirit of Christ. You want to follow me? Well, here's what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to do this. You want to follow me? Take up your cross. I'm taking up my cross. If you want to follow me, then you do the same. Take up your cross. Take up your burden. Take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. It's not about you. Jesus denied himself. Jesus had to literally take his cross, and that's something that hadn't even happened yet, right? But he, he's telling them in advance, take up your cross. They probably don't even understand exactly what he's talking about at this point. But boy, they sure did afterwards, huh? As he's literally carrying his cross to his, to his death. Oh, now I get it. And he takes that burden on after he's already been beat up and whipped and, and already is, doesn't have much strength at all to just keep moving. That's why they had to have someone else then help him to be able to, to bring it up to to the crucifixion site. He just physically couldn't even do it, yet he was still just, just bearing that cross. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. He says, for whosoever shall, lose, shall save his life shall lose it. He said, you're all just worried about your physical life here. It'll just end up be taken away anyways. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What good is that? You could be the richest, most powerful man in the world. What good is that if you lose your soul? You'd be on top of the world for the, the length of time of a vapor. And your soul is just damned to hell forever. What good is that? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that last verse there, I'm going to cover that next week already kind of going a little late this long this evening. Um, I believe this is fulfilled just at, in the very next chapter, in the, next, in the first verses of chapter 17, because obviously this isn't talking about the, like Jesus Christ's second coming because it hasn't happened yet. 
but they, they see that at the Mount of Transfiguration, which we're going to cover next week. But, um, but just to, to recap, up until verse 28, verse 27, Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. He, this is kind of what he wraps up. Hey, take up your cross, follow me, deny yourself, do all this stuff. Why? Because you're going to be rewarded. You're going to be rewarded for it. And that's some good news, and that's some hope. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all the instruction that we can receive from your words. God, I pray that you would please just help us to learn and to grow and understand more. Help us have good doctrine and not to be influenced by, by false prophets out there and these devils, these doctrines of devils that, will, um, that could potentially corrupt uh, our good doctrine. Lord, help us to, to maintain good doctrine. I pray that you would open up our understanding and give us knowledge and wisdom to, uh, to know what's right and be able to discern right from wrong. Lord, um, we just thank you so much for, for loving us and, and, and watching over us. In Jesus' name we pray.